Thank you, Tamar, and so glad to be here with all of you lovely women on such an important topic. So as Tamar mentioned, I have written this book on how to age vibrantly, and um, that came from my work, which is that this tends to be an issue very much on the minds of the clients, the wealthy families that we serve. I wrote a book three years ago on raising children well amid wealth, which is sort of number one topic people are concerned about, how to raise children who aren't demotivated by the affluence around them, and then sort of I'd say second is how do I age well myself and how do I minimize any burden that my aging might cause on my loved ones. So I sought to interview people leading vibrant later lives is how I put it uh, and tried to share the takeaways that I learned from them. And I found that with my first book, this sort of what works success story format is much more inspiring for people than sort of talking about all the things that might go wrong. So I'm going to share in the time we have today some of the key takeaways I learned from these lovely people I got to speak with. I will say, first off, that one challenge I found in writing about aging is that people tend not to talk about aging. I think it's still, sadly, somewhat of a taboo topic. And sometimes for a reason as simple as um, one of my interviewees said, I don't feel old. You know, I'm 83, but inside I'm 42. And one of the things I found is that I actually think that's not a bad way to go about life. I would just say save 5% of the time to plan for the fact that you are actually not 42. Um, and then, of course, there are all the reasons people avoid the topic actively, you know, fear, fear of incapacity, fear of death. And so one of my missions was to write a book that would shine a positive light on aging and how it can go well so that people will try to be less fearful and therefore not avoid talking about aging. Because I think if we avoid it, we actually lose the opportunity to do some of the planning that would mitigate a lot of these fears. So let me just spend time on sharing the four takeaways I heard from these lovely people. I interviewed people across their late 60s, 70s, 80s. Now some of the people I interviewed are in their 90s. And there are four key factors I learned. I'm going to summarize each one and then give you a couple stories from the book about each. And I'll be so interested when we hear from Rabbi Geller and Naomi about the work they're doing in the communities, whether this is something they're seeing as well. Uh, the first one is under the heading of agency. And what that meant is that I heard from everybody interviewed something like, I am in charge of my own life. I'm not waiting for my children to come and make my life pleasant. I'm not waiting on friends. I'm, I really feel like it's my job to, as one of my interviewees said, make lemonade out of lemons. You know, it's sort of have to attack life proactively. And I was so intrigued by that. It made me actually wonder, did I happen to just find people who were born this way? And that'd be interesting, but a little sad if you weren't born that way. So I wanted to share a story from my research that makes me think, um, actually, no, you can become one of these people overnight. There was a woman, Diane, I interviewed in her 60s, but she was recounting a time in her 40s. And what she was talking about was a time when she was sitting there in the car pickup line for her teenage children and kind of musing about her life. And she was finding herself dissatisfied. She had left the working world when they were first born. Uh, now she'd been out for a number of years. A number of her friends were going through divorces and she was feeling kind of restless and unhappy with some of her recent choices. She had just not gone to a very good friend's party because the woman had lived several hours away across state lines and Diane hadn't wanted to drive at night by herself. And so in the middle of all of this, she starts to think about Paris and how much she always wanted to go to Paris. And then she remembered that her husband, who was born abroad and had traveled widely, said something like, been there, done that, no interest in going back. And she realized um, in this moment, he's never going to take me to Paris. And then she said to herself, does that mean I'm never going to Paris? And she thought sort of indignantly, that can't mean I'm never going to Paris. And she decided in the car to sign up for this art history tour of Paris with perfect strangers, a group of women. And 15 years later, she's traveled all over the world. She's become a trained art historian. She has met people all over the world who are good friends. She's having so much fun that now her husband is asking to come along with her. And I was so inspired by that story because it shows that you truly can, in a moment, decide to try to be more proactive in how you go about your own life. And Diane actually calls this a sacred selfishness. But it's essentially a concept she thinks of that means she's focused on her own happiness to the point that it will actually allow her to be present in her relationships with her loved ones and actually be a better mother, wife, et cetera, for them. Um, so then the next question I wondered was, what are the various mental tools that people can use to have this sense of agency? And there were several things I heard. Sense of humor is really good. A sense of gratitude. 
Most of all, I'd say, is a sense that things might always be worse. A truly proactive ability to cultivate an imagined reality that would be worse than what you are currently experiencing, which I think is actually a very useful mental tool tool as you start to approach the declining capacities that may accompany age. A lot of the people I spoke with said something like, look, you know, I'm here. It could be worse, you know. And I actually think that fundamental attitude has allowed them to appreciate where they are, even with capacities that are less than they might have been when they were younger. Um, Cheryl Sandberg actually talks about this in her new book, Option B, and about how her husband tragically passed away and a friend said to her after this well it might have been worse and she said I don't know what you're talking about you know I'm a young widow and he said well he could have had that cardiac event driving your children and even amidst that terrible tragedy she did actually feel this sense of appreciation for what didn't happen so the other thing I asked people about was role models whether they had good role models of aging and I'd say about half of the people did and half the people didn't I actually heard a pattern when I interviewed couples there'd often be the pattern where one mother or mother-in-law was the epitome of graceful aging happy everyone loved being around her and the other one was sort of the opposite needy, very demanding, always complains that you're not calling essentially <laughs> in essence. And I put these stories, even though it's a positive book, I did put a couple pages in about these, this juxtaposition because what I often hear from people as a goal when they think of aging is I don't want to be a burden to my children. And these stories sort of demonstrated what people perceive as burdensome. Uh, so to wrap up agency, I'd say this really comes down to mindset. And there's a fascinating study that was done by a woman, Ellen Langer, who is affiliated with Harvard, she conducted this in the 1970s, and she took men who at the time were in their 70s and sent them away for a week to a monastery that had been converted as if it were the 1950s. And these guys were told to act as if they were themselves at that younger age, 20 years prior. So they had to dress as if they would have been in their career at that time, talk only about things they would have talked about at that time. The news looked like it was from the 50s. And these guys were measured prior to going and when they came out, physically, cognitively, pictures were taken. And what's amazing is after just one week, they measured cognitively sharper, they were physically more dexterous and nimble, and people who in a double-blind fashion had no idea what this whole thing had been about thought that the after pictures were of younger people. So this is a crazy study. It's been replicated. It's actually, it actually was a British reality TV show also. But what it shows is, and, and I should say, there was a control group that did the same thing. The only difference is that while the first group was told to mentally embody this younger self, the control group was told to reminisce about the days, those days in their life. And the first group that was mentally embodying that younger self did far better. So while I, I bring this up to say that my client who said inside I'm 42, this is actually, I think, a good thing. Uh, so let me take us on to now the next factor, which is growth. So growth is all about continual learning. And there's the myth that, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And there is the biological reality, which is that neural plasticity, the ability of our neurons to grow is a lifelong ability. But then there, I think there really is the human challenge, which is that if you take, as, as my clients tend to be people who've experienced a lot of success in life, are used to being sought after for their area of expertise, and you actually put them into an environment where they would learn something entirely new, it can be very humbling because it requires them to spend some time feeling really bad at something. And that mental challenge of being uh, really bad at something can be so difficult for people that they actually resist that type of growth environment. So I asked my clients how they dealt with that. And um, I heard all kinds of funny stories, like one of the guys I interviewed said that he had been a lifelong golfer and then got bored of golf in his late 60s, so decides to take up yoga. And he said the worst part about yoga was not the physical challenge. He said it was the embarrassment and the humiliation of having to crawl out of the first class halfway through on his hands and knees because he couldn't do anything. And he said he's surrounded by all these 20-something young guns doing all these crazy things. And he just said it was just really embarrassing and I had to get over that. So I interviewed, one of the people I interviewed for the book is named Raymond. By the way, these are all fake names. And the reason is you might say, well, why wouldn't people want to be identified? These are all happy stories. I found in talking to particularly the latter end of that age spectrum, people in their 80s and, and up, that they were much more vulnerable with me than they would be with their family members. I asked one gentleman who, who was in tears on the 
conversation with me, have you shared this beautiful story you're telling me with your children? He said, oh, no, I would never tell my children this. You know, they think I'm the rock. They, they wouldn't kind of see me in this role. So I think I had to kind of let people be honest, but all, the, all of the quotes in the book are their actual quotes, so these stories really come alive. Um, so anyway, one of the individuals I talk with is named Raymond in the book. He's one of the reasons I wrote this book. I'm just so curious to know what, Raymond, uh, what makes Raymond tick, because I worked with him for 15 years. He honestly, in my mind, has aged backwards over that period of time. When, he, when I first met him, he was rolling off a highly successful career in private equity. He was very type A, very controlling in all the best ways. And in these last 15 years, he's done all of the following things. Uh, become a cattle roper, competing and winning against men in their 20s. He's gone on to do a documentary film that was very well received. He's become a photographer. He now has shows of all his photography. So I've just been so awe inspired by him. And one of the things I wanted to know is how did he do this? You know, how did he learn all of these things? And I just want to share with you what he said, which is essentially that he decided to use his financial resources to pay for apprenticeships for himself. So he said, Having resources allows you to do things. How many years do I have? I don't have the time to learn this on my own. I need a crash course. Someone has got to get me going and feed me with a fire hose. So he essentially would hire people to mentor him and that allowed him to learn things much more quickly and I think actually much more enjoyably. Um, and on the issue of humiliation, he says, he sees no shame in trying and failing. It's not always pleasant to be embarrassed or make mistakes. But I think you just have to do it. When you stop learning, stop evolving with what's happening out there, you drop off and become irrelevant. I didn't want to be one of those people who think they know everything. And I thought that was so well put. You're sort of either someone who's open to learning new things or you have put yourself in the box of people who think they know everything. So my next question after Raymond was, is there an age cutoff to this? I mean, Raymond began this whole process in his mid-60s and, and what I would say is the phase of life, which I've now seen some people refer to as young old. There's young old and old old. And so I wondered, you know, can this be done at any age? And I want to share a story from the book, a woman, Catherine. So I learned about Catherine when I interviewed her son. So I had actually sought to interview her son who was in his 60s at the time. And when I started talking about neuroplasticity I, and growth, he said, oh, my mother was the poster child for that. And then I hear the story of Catherine, which starts when she's 82. And he said that she was living in the condo in Florida that she had lived in for the last 15 years since her husband, his father, had died. And he said this was not going well. She was, as he put it, uh, well, she wasn't caring for herself very well, wasn't taking her medication, and as he put it, was playing cards all day with people who were angry, depressive, or sick. So she was pretty negative. So after about a year of cajoling and encouraging her to move closer to him and his wife, she makes the move into this very lovely, high-end senior community. And what he said was, after about the first day of transition, she starts to look around the apartment, and this is his mom who has not bought one new thing for the last 15 years, and starts to say, can we think we can buy some new things? And, and he says, sure, mom. You know, and then has, uh, son and, and mom go out and outfit the apartment in totally new things. And the next week, she's going down, walking by the lovely pool they have there, and this is his mother who's never been interested in swimming. There's physical trainers there, and they say, why don't you try it? And they put some little water wings on her, and lo and behold, turns out she really likes swimming. And this pattern kept repeating itself. And as he put it, she decided she wanted to restart her life. It was incredible. She went from having the most negative attitude to having the most positive attitude ever. She fell in love with the people in the community, and they fell in love with her. After six months, she was going to 10 gym classes a week. And he said, moving into assisted living meant that she was freed up to have a ball, which I thought was so sweet and very uh, inspiring for any of us who wonder whether you can do this at any age. And she passed away three years later, and 250 people who she had not met prior to this move came to her funeral. And he said that she told him at the end, I've had a great life, and I wouldn't have traded the last three years for anything. So... This 250 people brings me to the third factor, which is 
engagement, which is essentially about relationships. Um, by the way, if you've been following along, you might be seeing that these factors A, G, E, and there's one more, it's going to be D, spell aged. And that's not because I sought factors that actually match that word, uh, but it's because I had this epiphany when I was writing that the attributes I was hearing about from people could actually be described in words that would follow that acronym. And that that would be really cool because one, we could all remember this better. And two, it might play a very small role in changing this negative connotation of aging. You know, if we could all say, yay, I hope I can be aged, uh, that might be a really good thing. So, so engagement is about relationships. I'm, I'll be very interested to hear from our other speakers about this. So a lot of studies, including a Harvard, the longest running longitudinal study done of aging, starting with men in the 1930s and still following any of them who are still living and their children and grandchildren, say that one of the major uh, things that contribute to longevity is relationships. So I was interested to ask, is this spouses, is this children? And what's interesting is a lot of the research says it's actually far beyond that. It doesn't have to be that. In fact, in many ways, it's better if it's people who are different from you, people who are younger from you, uh, essentially something that stretches your mind cognitively and, and forces you to reach out to someone who you have to bridge a, a gap to relate to. There's another concept of elderhood that's really critical in the developmental literature, and we all have heard of childhood, and it's embraced and celebrated in our society, and there really is an equivalent concept of elderhood that is sadly really not embraced and celebrated. And if you think back to sort of our concept of the wizened guru in an ancient society who people would have sought out uh, for advice and guidance, that is really one of the primary gifts that an elder can give to society. And if you think of one of the ways in which that gift often comes is through a mentor-mentee relationship. And so one of the findings from the people I interviewed and researched was how important it was to actually be able to continue that sort of mentor relationship later in life. And if you think about your typical job setting, that's often totally, uh, there are many opportunities for mentorship just ad hoc in a career setting and in child rearing, but that when those responsibilities sort of uh, wane in life, you have to proactively recreate opportunities for mentorship. Another interesting concept, a, a bad stereotype of older people is that they become curmudgeonly and therefore set in their ways and really can't do a good job of relating to someone who may not agree with what they think. And I tested this concept in, with the people I interviewed and I said, do you feel like you've become more or less judgmental as you've gotten older? And actually everyone said they feel like they've gotten less judgmental. And the reason is they said, one woman I interviewed said something like, um, here's what happens in life. You come out of the gate with your own high bar of your own behavior. And then what happens is you live, is you start to fall short of your own high bar. And when that happens, you naturally have more empathy for others who do the same. And there's a wonderful story in the book. I won't go into it now because it's too long, but a, a lovely client of mine named Joseph, who the story starts with his knowing about this guy, Carl, and viewing him as a bombastic narcissist and a real bore. And by the end of the story, which sort of had its milestone moment when they were seated next to each other at a dinner and they had to actually, Joseph had to sort of invest in this three hour discussion. Three years later, he and Carl are really good friends and Joseph actually invites him to his weekly barbecue for his closest friends. And when I was asking Joseph, how did this happen? He said, what's really interesting as I'm telling you this is I'm realizing that Carl never changed. He didn't change over this space of time. What changed was how I perceived Carl. And I think that just goes back to the concept of mindset. Mindset affects not only our own way of going through the world in terms of our own happiness, but how we perceive others. And I heard a lot of really fascinating stories of people who found that in aging, they could be more open to others and took the time to be more open to others. So that was very inspiring. The last factor is D for drive, which is essentially purpose. There are a number of studies that show biologically how critical purpose is. There's one that shows the people who on autopsy presented dementia symptoms, dementia pathology and plaques, et cetera, actually were not symptomatic of dementia in life. And they rated very highly on purpose scores. There's another study that gave people the sentence, I feel as if I have done all there is to do in life. And I and asked them to rate that one to 10, 10 being you really agree with it. So somewhat not surprisingly, it's not good to give that a 10 in terms of your longevity. Uh, so essentially the conclusion there being, I say it's good for all of us multitaskers, task 
stickers. It's good to have a long list of things you hope you'll get to at some point in life. So what I was interested to ask the people I interviewed was the challenge of purpose is that if you've had a highly successful career or a highly engaged life, that has sort of either career or child rearing sort of serve up purpose on a silver platter. And when that episode in life sort of moves on, you have to seek purpose more proactively. And so I was interested in understanding how people found that. And I heard a lot of really wonderful stories about how people took either skills they had developed and then could tack to something totally new or took that list of things that they never had had a chance to get to and started going down the list when they finally had the time to do so. There's a wonderful story about a guy, Francis, in the book who had sort of a somewhat typical uh, trajectory in what I see in my work, grew up very poor, Lower East Side, and chose to get a highly successful career going as a result so that he would never have to experience that level of poverty again. His family wouldn't have to. So ends up spending a number of years working exhaustively and any free time was devoted to his family. And as he put it to me, for 42 years when working, I did not reach out to help anyone else. And I was very aware of what I wanted to go toward. And he ended up devoting 15 years after his work life had ended to a charitable organization that he found in his community that taught him quite a bit about how he was seeing people. And that even though he felt like he'd had a highly successful career, there was actually so much more that he could learn about how people actually related to one another. So. Um, there's a lot of stories like that in the book about how people have done that. So I want to just tack briefly to how this comes together. You know, do you just cultivate these AGED, you know, agency growth, engagement drive, those four factors, do they just come naturally? And I found that the people I spoke with really were intentional about trying to have these elements in their life, whether they called it that or not, uh, you know, those words, they had an effort to try to be this way. And I put a chapter in the book, chapter five, all that is all about essentially how do you go through a self-reflective process to get yourself to start to try to embrace these factors in your life. Uh, what I find with the clients I serve, money is typically not the finite resource. The truly finite resource is time. And I think that especially if you've had a successful life, I find successful people tend to be in a constant state of forward momentum. And it can actually take something happening, you know, a milestone like the birth of a grandchild or an illness or something to stop that forward train and give people the sort of shock almost to take a step back and reflect on their life. So there's some really good questions in there. One being, if you're, if you have five years to live, how might you change your life? And my favorite is these come from a gentleman, George Kinder, who is in our profession, who founded what's called the financial life planning movement. You know, how you harness your financial resources to really live a, a life of meaning and purpose. The, the question is, if you go to the doctor and you're told this is your last day on earth, what is that first sense you'd have of the regret you'd have in terms of who you didn't get a chance to be or what you didn't get a chance to do? And that that is really where you should start in this list of things that you want to use this time to, to do. In my remaining very um, short time, I just want to briefly mention the second half of the book is all about if the first half is about things we can all do to enhance our own aging experience, the second half is about things we can do to enhance the experience of the loved ones who will see us age and who will be left behind as a result of our aging and um, eventual death. And that's all really stories from the perspective of middle-aged children who are grateful that their parents did certain things. And so I put this whole section under the heading, the gift of clarity, but it comes down to if you have two hypothetical adult children and the first knows the answer to all the following questions, where their parents would like to spend the remainder of their life, how they would like their life to end, what family stories they would like passed down, why they made the estate planning decisions they did. And the second child knows the answer to none of these questions. And you ask, which child would we all rather be? Most of us would rather be child one. And sadly, based on how infrequently these conversations happen, most will be child two. And worse than that, most of us will make our own children be child two because we won't do the thinking that's required to actually communicate what we want. And so in that 
section of the book, at the end of each chapter, one chapter is all about family stories, ethical wills, meaning behind your estate plan. The next chapter is all about changing minds and capacities, you know, those later years of life when the home you've always lived in has been easy for you to live in may not, no longer be that, when you may have potentially cognitive issues, how you handle that in a way that works well for you and your family. And then the last chapter is on end of life wishes and death. And there is a list of questions at the end of each of those chapters that I really recommend people go through the exercise of answering for themselves. I'll share one story about that, which is about uh, from my own family. Um, so I sort of test out consultants that I give to my clients uh, before I recommend them to my clients. And I was interested in testing out a wonderful gentleman who lives locally to me in the Boston area who does oral histories and family memoirs. And so I hired him to record a two hour interview with my mother, father, and my aunt. And I thought about two things with this. One was I wanted to see whether I liked working with this guy. And two, I thought briefly of my daughter who was four at the time and thought, well, this will be nice for her to have at some point in the future. And uh, about a year and a half after I just got this recording from this lovely man and stuck it in a drawer and was glad to have it and didn't even listen to it, I got the call that my father had passed away suddenly. And um, I, I share the story because it was not until this happened to me that I understood the absolutely priceless value of that recording. I listened to it three days after my dad's death and I had his laughter and I had his stories. And I talk about this because here I'm in this career, I recommend people do this all the time. And not until I had experienced it myself did I truly understand the value. So I encourage people to not only record any loved one who might still be here, um, but to not forget about themselves because we are all keepers of stories and it's easy. I mean, you can do this on an iPhone and it's truly something that can never be gotten back if you miss that chance. So there's a lot of stories in that section that are about things people did. The last one I'll leave you with in my last minute, there's a woman I interviewed, Sarah Putnam. That's her real name. She's a videographer. And the story she told, I like to end on because it's actually a positive dementia story. Her father, who just happened to be a planner kind of person, started in his 40s spending New Year's Day every day. The family laughingly called it the annual dirge. Uh, he would write on a yellow pad, here's what happens in mom and I, if mom and I go down the plane. And here's who you need to call. Here's who I want at the funeral. Here are my wishes, all this stuff. And they, because of this, because this happened every year, they had these pretty interesting long conversations for a number of years about end of life. He was diagnosed with early onset dementia at age 62. And it was a complete shock. It was very tragic. But what she said to me was, amid this tragedy, his having done this was such a gift because when he finally was in a home and community where they were caring for him, the place called and asked the seemingly simple question, should we administer antibiotics? And she said that question could be devastating for families who don't know how to answer it. But she and her mother knew exactly how to answer it because they knew what he wanted. And he was there with him, with them in spirit, essentially speaking for himself. And she said he gave them such a gift in doing that. So my point in this section of the book is we all have the ability to give our children and loved one these gifts and we should do it because it's something only we can do and they will really appreciate that we allow them to have peace over these issues. So I am done and maybe we'll have time for questions but I will turn it over to the other presenters because I don't want to shortchange their time. Thanks so much. Thank, oh, thank you so much Covey. Um, <clears throat> My name is Naomi Strongin, and, and Covey, I know, um, I'm sure Rabbi Geller can speak more um, about all the connections between what you're saying and the work of High Village LA um, in terms of the growth and learning and relationship building um, that, that they're doing there. But what I'm going to do very briefly is speak, um, giving a funder's perspective on the importance of investing in older adults in that demographic, and then I'll turn it over to Rabbi Geller to speak more about her program. So the Jewish Community Foundation of Los Angeles is a major funder of uh, innovation in the Los Angeles Jewish community. We've launched over 100 new programs. We've granted nearly $20 million in this area since 2006 through what we call our Cutting Edge Grants program. So while funding of older adults, uh, baby boomers or seniors is not the sole focus of our grant making, Innovation is, and that's part of the innovative grant making that we do. 
We fund programs that fill unmet, unmet needs, that are unique and that will have long-lasting impact on the, on the population being served, on their communities, on the larger Los Angeles Jewish community. We fund in all areas from arts and culture to Israel advocacy, next-gen engagement, youth programs, <clears throat> programs for special needs populations, and our grantee organizations serve a span of age groups from the youngest children to Holocaust survivors. As I'm sure many of you have seen in the grant making that you do, the majority of proposals that come across our, my desk are really focused on the younger populations. How do we engage millennials? How do we engage teens and children to help ensure uh, the Jewish future? What is really less often the topic of conversation is how to invest in older adults in the baby boomer generation, uh, which is also really ensuring the Jewish future. Most boomers are still vibrant and capable of making significant contributions to our community. The generation has energy, creativity, and talent that's being passed down to future generations. So how can our community invest in programs that provide meaningful pathways to serve this highly educated, highly successful, and very large population, and do so with the Jewish lens and Jewish values as the guide? So when Rabbi Geller and her team from Temple Emanuel Beverly Hills in collaboration with Temple Isaiah brought the idea of High Village LA to us, uh, which is the first ever intercongregational baby boomer village, it was really one of the first proposals uh, that we had seen that addressed this question and that focused its meaningful Jewish work on older adults. Uh, Rabbi Geller will tell you more, but based on the larger village movement where older adults become members and gain access to programs and services. And it provides a way for the baby boomer generation to age in place while staying connected to their Jewish traditions, communities, and synagogues. Rabbi Geller and her colleagues made a great case for the importance of investing in the baby boomer generation. This is a generation of experience with skills, talent, and resources. And they made the case for how an investment in baby boomers is also really an investment in Gen Xers, in millennials, and in the generations after them. The foundation, our committee, our board was really truly energized and excited to be seed funders of an initiative for this demographic that had so much potential to make an impact on not only the Jewish baby boomer population, but on future generations. It's now been three years since we awarded a grant to High Village LA, and three years later, we've really seen the potential become a reality as this idea has transformed into a thriving, impactful program. We really helped pave the way for other funders to see the importance of this kind of investment, as many other Jewish funders have now signed on to support High Village LA, as well as other programs supporting this population. And actually our own board really has seen the importance and impact of the investment. And a couple of years later in 2017, invested in capital projects to institutions that would benefit LA's older adult Jewish communities. We at the Jewish Community Foundation look forward to our continued relationship with High Village LA. And we look forward to continuing to support other innovative ideas and institutions that provide meaningful impact to older adults. So with that, I, uh, I said I'd keep it brief, and I'm going to turn it over to Rabbi Laura Geller to talk about High Village LA. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, let, because I'm a rabbi, let me begin with a uh, quick reference to the Torah portion. Not this week, but next week. The famous Torah portion, Lech Lecha. It begins, and God said to Avram Lech Lecha, go, really go, from your land, your birthplace, your father's house, to the land that I will show you, and you will be a blessing. In the very next verse, we learn how old Avram was when he, and in my view, Sarai as well, received that invitation. He was 75 years old. I want to point out, Avram and Sarai were not millennials. They were seasoned adults, and they heard an invitation to explore their next stage. And that certainly led to blessing for the Jewish people. I am so grateful to the wise philanthropy of the Jewish Community Foundation's Cutting Edge Grant, which enabled us to hear the invitation that grew out of a listening campaign that began at Temple Emanuel of Beverly Hills in 2012. We brought together over 250 members 55 to 75 years old in small groups 
to hear about how they felt what many social scientists are describing as a new stage of life, the period between raising our families and building our careers and frail old age. This is new. It didn't exist for many of our grandparents. For some people, this new stage can be as many as 25 or 30 years. And again, it's not these years tagged on at the end of life, but it's the stage between midlife and frail old age. We ask people what their fears and hopes were, what keeps them up at night, and what gets them up in the morning. The four major fears were becoming invisible, becoming isolated, becoming dependent, and not having a sense of purpose. And one of the hopes that emerged is that people wanted to stay in their homes as long as possible. This led us to explore the village movement and eventually to create High Village LA. So just quick background, Naomi mentioned this, but the village movement began in 2002 in Beacon Hill in Boston, when neighbors got together to figure out how they could grow older in the homes they loved. There are now about 200 villages around the country and maybe about 150 more in formation. A village is not a place, it's a community that's led by adults who share optimism, skills, support, and expertise with each other. It's a radical old idea, neighbors helping neighbors, through services like walking the dog when someone's out of town, bringing meals when someone is sick, providing transportation to medical appointments, or assisting with technology. As important and these service, as these services are, many villages are finding that social programs are even more valuable to their members in helping them continue to build the social capital that often contracts as people retire and their lives changed. In fact, research by the AARP has shown that village members experience reduced isolation, increased independence, and a deeper sense of purpose. Turns out that loneliness is a serious public health issue. A recent study showed that lacking social connections is as damaging to our health as obesity or smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And just this past January, the United Kingdom created a new ministry of loneliness to begin to find solutions to this public health concern. And it's obvious that loneliness often increases as people grow older and no longer have the social capital that was provided by colleagues at work or the social networks that might have been part of their lives when they were younger and raising families. So High Village LA is an antidote to loneliness and invisibility. And it's also reinforcing the truth that Jewish tradition knows so well. None of us is ever independent. We're all interdependent. And through High Village LA, we're redefining the notion of interdependence to be one of mutuality and agency. And through High Village, many of our members are rediscovering a sense of purpose. So it is a response to the kinds of issues that Kobe raised in her presentation. So as Naomi said, we're a synagogue village, the only one in the country. That means that you have to be a member of one of our two synagogues. And because you're already paying membership dues in those synagogues, we've kept the membership dues to the village very low. It's been an amazing win-win for both the synagogues and the village. Boomers who've been thinking of leaving our synagogues are staying connected and others are actually joining the synagogue so they can be part of the village. And because the expectation is that everyone volunteers in some way, leading a program, hosting a program, serving on village committees, volunteering in the larger community or in the synagogue, it turns out that the synagogue has more volunteers. And the village benefits from the partnership. We're technically a project of Temple Emanuel, so we're covered by Emanuel's insurance and backroom expenses, payroll, et cetera, are also covered. Most of our programs happen in members' homes, but some actually happen in the synagogue, like a recent uh, talk by a member of the village who recently retired from the Brookings Institute. He spoke about Korea. hundred people came to that. We're member-driven and member-led. Members lead programs. 
interest groups that take advantage of their specific areas of expertise or interest. So again, these people are no longer invisible. They are seen for the experts, the experienced people that they are. All different kinds of programs, art appreciation, new member potlucks, tours, authors nights, computer training, current events, wise aging groups, um, several village-wide programs a year, uh, including a Passover Seder where the four elders instead of four children. This year we had about 120 people come to that Seder. Since our official launch in July 2016, High Village has grown to about 220 people, half from each of the two synagogues. Members volunteer four hours a month, some of them by offering services to other members. A committee of members um, established a training protocol for how to be effective volunteers. And ultimately 110 village members went through the training and we officially began to accept requests for services um, in March of 2017. Interestingly, it seems easier to offer help than actually to ask for it. So our large volunteer pool surpassed our need for service providers. We expect though that as members age or unexpected medical needs arrive, there'll be more needs and more willingness to receive these services, but it's clear we have more work to do to uh, create a culture where asking for help becomes easier to do. So we've come a long way since that initial grant. The terms of the grant, this WISE Foundation, included hiring a professional evaluator to see how we're doing. A few highlights of that evaluation, 83% of the respondents look forward to attending village activities, 64% made new friends, 98% are satisfied with the overall benefits. Turns out there are two cohorts in the village. 80% of our members are 60 to healthy late 70s and 20% are over 80. And we now have a group of 80s plus with 40 members who meet monthly. And very significantly, members' feeling of being connected to their synagogues have increased. There's also been a lot of interest from members of other synagogues who don't feel that their synagogues are completely meeting their needs. So we just set up an affiliated synagogue membership program for people who are members of other synagogues in Los Angeles but want to also be part of our village. But the village isn't just about providing services to each other and making friends. We've become part of an energy that is changing the paradigm of getting older. We're working with Gen to Gen, which is part of a project created by Encore.org to engage a million boomers with young people around the country. And we're now also part of Village Movement California, which is a coalition of the other 40 plus villages in California with the aim of figuring out how working together, we can reshape the conversation about aging in California. And finally, we've been overwhelmed by inquiries from the Jewish community, from Jewish communities around the country, uh, wanting to understand what we're doing and how we're doing it. We've begun conversations with some local synagogues who've asked for our help in establishing synagogue villages of their own. And we just recently received a grant from another foundation to help us do it. It feels as though this is a moment that offers a new beginning, just like the one in our Torah portion. Jewish funders are beginning to notice that ensuring the Jewish future is not just investment in millennials and young families, but also in this huge cohort of people who want to be engaged, who have talent, energy, discretionary time, and in some cases, discretionary resources. And because of this increased attention, new Jewish initiatives are emerging, including one that I hope you know about called Wise Aging. It's a project of the Institute for Jewish Spirituality, which has, has trained facilitators around the country to offer wise aging groups in all kinds of settings, synagogues, JCCs, people's homes, dealing with a lot of the same kinds of issues that Kobe raised, but from a very wonderfully intentional Jewish perspective. Um, and I am particularly interested in what seems to be a new thinking about 
intergenerational spaces? How can we bring boomers and millennials together? For example, all of a sudden, I'm hearing about new visions of grandparenting that capitalizes on the significant impact Jewish grandparents can have in their grandchildren's and other people's grandchildren's lives. It really does feel like this is only the beginning. And like with Avram and Sarai, exploring this next stage will lead to blessings for boomers themselves and ultimately for our entire Jewish community. Thank you, Jewish Community Foundation, for uh, giving us a start and enabling us to invest in, uh, in our vision. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate all of the presenters and their and their thoughts and their presentations. As if as we wait for a question or two to come in with our few minutes, if there are any questions out there, please go to the to the bottom of your screens in the Q and A, and please ask the presenters your questions, and I will will, will relay them. But let's start off um, in the time that we have left with one question for all of you, and we can go around. Is is there a key takeaway that you have from your work that you've been doing the last few years that was kind of surprising that you didn't realize would happen and that you would learn from that when you first started and on this and I guess let's start with um, Naomi. That's sure it. I mean <clears throat> again as, as I mentioned as a funder of really innovative programs we're, we're seeing so many programs for millennials for teens for children um, and the population is getting younger and so, and so we, when we launched, when we, when we seed funded Defy Village LA, it was an experiment. It was, you know, we didn't know if it was going to work. And what we've seen over these last three years is that it's exceeded, I think, it, I, I don't know if it's exceeded what Rabbi Geller knew it was going to be, but it's really, you know, exceeded, you know, any expectations. And it's been such a pleasure to see that grow. And, and it's really helped us, as I said, um, see the importance of investing in this population on a larger level. Okay, thank you. Rabbi Geller? So I think for us a big surprise was that people, we thought people would join because they would want to provide services for other people mm -hmm. or to receive services. And it turns out that people wanted social, um, you know, capital. Um, Mm -hmm. Who knew that people that were so busy, senior law partners or whatever, as they retired, their worlds would contract mm -hmm. and it would be hard for them to reinvent themselves. And this has been amazingly um, nurturing and blossoming and uh, empowering. Wonderful. Thank you. And Kavi, how about you with your interviews? Any yeah, well, so um, first of all, I really agree with Every, I mean, it's wonderful the work that Rabbi Geller is doing, and the whole multi generational aspect I think is really critical. One takeaway I had is simply the fact that I went through this process of having the chance to interview all these wonderful older people showed me how infrequently that type of interaction happens in life uh, and how infrequently they are asked the questions I ask them. So I think that anything that allows it e to be easier for generations to interact would be wonderful. The other thing that was somewhat interesting to me is that here I saw all these people living these wonderful, vibrant, older lives, and I asked them this series of questions, which is actually at the end of the book. And at the very end of the questions, I asked, so have you, have you done any planning for end of life? Have you, had, have you had discussions with your children? And there was a, I'd say, a highly negative correlation between living a vibrant life in your later years and actually doing thinking and communicating about end of life, which is, I'd say, fewer than 10% of my interviewees had done that. So that's one of the reasons I included these positive stories in the second half of the book from the perspective of the adult children whose parents did do that. Because I think one of the gifts that all of us who work with people in this age group can do is encourage them to do that thinking because it actually is so helpful for family harmony that will be the legacy they will leave after they are no longer here. Thank you. Thank you. And I think with with that, I will invite people, if they have any additional questions, to reach out to me and I can reach out to all of our presenters. And I want to thank all the participants and especially thank um, all of our speakers today for presenting about your work. And we really appreciate you, you sharing your knowledge with all of us and the network today.
Thank you all very much and have a great day.